One week. One week, Big Johnny. And we are back here. It is Wrestling Uncensored. It's a Friday night. And uh, we are a week away from the biggest wrestling event of the year. Not only the biggest wrestling event of the year, WrestleMania, but WrestleMania 40. The 40th edition of WrestleMania. What am I hearing in my headphones? Is that, are you oh, hearing? that's me. Question. That's me. Oh, Did you hear that too? I, I didn't hear you. I heard you, but I didn't hear any echoes. I was hearing an echo because that was on uh, That was me. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I'm excited for WrestleMania, John. It's coming up. We have a huge card. We have The Rock. We have Cody Rhodes. We have Roman Reigns. I'm excited for the spectacle. I'm not sure that there is any one match that I'm excited about. I think that the one match that I'm most excited about in professional wrestling right now is Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay at AEW's Dynasty pay-per-view. It is called Dynasty, right? Did I get that right? That's right. So the AEW Dynasty show. Um, that match, da- Danielson versus Osprey. I mean, that's the one match that I have uh, circled as the most incredible match that we're going to see probably in the month of April. But just the spectacle of WrestleMania, the fact that The Rock will be wrestling, seeing that, seeing what that will be about, how he will wrestle, how the match will play out, what will happen. It's more about you know, the build to WrestleMania, the story that they have told, and how they will, say it with me now, finish this story. I don't know if it's about the matches. I don't know if it's about what's going to happen between the ropes as far as, you know, what are you hyped for? What do you think is going to steal the show? I think we're going to have some matches that will be good, but... As far as, you know, match quality, that's not really what we're looking for at WrestleMania. I think we're looking to see what the WWE is going to decide to do here on their biggest nights of the year. Right? What are you laughing at? Well, you're changing color. Right yeah, right? Am I changing like, color? Constantly. What's happening? What's happening? I think, I'm okay, but... I think... I. I'm like a weird color because we had to readjust because of this hoodie. Should I remove the hoodie? Uh, Is this the problem? Am I causing problems because I put because I I wasn't wearing this hoodie. I was wearing a different hoodie, and then I came in, and then I changed hoodies because I want I, the old hoodie was kind of rattier, and I was like, let me put on a nicer hoodie, and then I think I changed the color scheme of what was going on. So I think that was my fault. Are we okay? It was the hoodie, but it's okay now, I'm being told. <laughs> Sorry. Do I look okay, John? How do I look? No, you look fine now. And um, I want to be excited about WrestleMania, but tonight did not make me very excited. Raw did, but I thought tonight's SmackDown was very disappointing. And I did not get excited for WrestleMania off what we got tonight. If anything, it felt like we got the leftovers from Raw. Nothing was really compelling tonight. But as Lior, who is a member of the team over at joined.ringsidereport.net, thank you, Lior, Angelo as well. I'm seeing shout out to all the members supporting the channel. Lior says the final boss is entertaining AF, and I agree. Hey, there's Jason Pete as well, live from Mexico. What's up, Jason? The final boss entertaining AF. I agree with that. And uh, what you're talking about is raw, Johnny North. What happened on Raw, and that was pretty good. If anything's going to get you excited for WrestleMania, it is The Rock beating Cody into a bloody pulp outside in the rain when the weather is even cooperating with the final boss, the people's champ, 
the most electrifying man in all of entertainment, The Rock, the great one. You know big things are happening. The weather said, yes, Rock, we acknowledge you. We will allow your segment to be as epic as possible and give you some rain. The Rock in the rain? It it almost looked like The Rock wasn't even getting wet. Like Cody was the only one, like soaking, soaking in the water and in blood. Rock was just like impervious to the rain somehow. That was amazing. What a moment that was. What a piece of business to build WrestleMania that was. That was the story of the week, John. Nothing happened in wrestling this week or maybe in the whole build to WrestleMania that was as majestic and epic as that. Mama Rhodes, look at the, you know, look at this belt, Mama Rhodes. Look at your boy's blood, putting the blood on the belt. I'm going to give this to you. This is the gift. He said he was going to beat him bloody. He was going to put the blood on. The belt and give it to Mama Rhodes. He's already got the bloody belt that says Mama Rhodes on it. It's got her name on it. Even though it doesn't matter what her name is. The Rock. That was uh, fantastic. I I assume you agree, John. Any problems with that segment? Like, did you have any issue with any of that? That was just... Great. You know, Cody opens the show, does his promo, talks about Roman and The Rock, and then The Rock comes out. We didn't think The Rock was going to be there. He wasn't advertised to be there, which is pretty crazy for the crowd to be in Chicago. It's a big night. You know you're going to get CM Punk. And then The Rock actually comes out unadvertised. You get The Rock. And he stares down Cody, says a couple words off mic. We don't hear what he says. Cody's asked what he says. Cody's not going to repeat it for some reason. And then later on, at the end of the show, we have The Rock beating up Cody through the arena in ba- in the backstage area and then into the parking lot where it's raining. And then Cody's beaten even more outside in the rain, and The Rock is talking trash, and Cody is bleeding. It was just a fantastic way to end Monday Night Raw. One of the best endings to Raw you'll ever see. Excellent stuff. Excellent. Really sold The Rock, too, as a physical force, because we've only seen him talking he's only been this verbal you know verbal assassin just destroying everybody on the mic we haven't seen him beating people up too we saw him slap cody but that's really it we haven't seen the rock get physical and we know he's gonna have a wrestling match he is in a team with roman reigns a week from tomorrow night at wrestlemania night one it'll be the rock and Roman against Cody and Seth Rollins coming up one week from tomorrow night. So we know The Rock is going to wrestle. We know he's going to get physical. And here on Monday Night Raw, finally we saw him get physical, not taking any bumps, not looking weak at all, not taking any punches, not taking anything, just beating up Cody Rhodes and showing that he is the final boss, that he is dominant in a physical manner, and he can get things done. And maybe Cody can't stop him. Because Cody getting no offense, The Rock just beating him senseless, leaving him for dead, that shows that The Rock is strong, and The Rock may not be able to be defeated by Cody and Seth. Rock and Roman, pretty formidable team. You already have Roman Reigns, the tribal chief. He's been dominating over everybody. Now here's the Rock, who's maybe even stronger than Roman, maybe even more powerful, maybe even more unbeatable. So I thought that was just a great 
way to present The Rock and Cody Rhodes in the build to WrestleMania because it just added so many elements to this story. No, I, I agree with you completely about how this was a great ending, one of the best endings you'll see on Raw in a long time. But it really brought home the fact that The Rock is someone you can't mess with and that Cody's in a lot of trouble. I still think Cody's going to come out in the end, though, now because of this. I think, if anything, they make it seem like Cody's weak and vulnerable, but in the end, he'll get his revenge because now The Rock got his, and then Cody will get his back on the big show. The only issues I had with this was the fact that this led up to the ending of the main event, not a very compelling main event of Jey Uso versus Shinsuke Nakamura. And that match... I don't know about you, I wasn't very interested in that match whatsoever. I thought this was like not the best way to end Raw, but it this what led to that fight at the end where Seth came out, Bloodline came out, Cody came out, they beat down the Bloodline to the back, and then Cody gets jumped by The Rock. And that's great, that's fine. Seth just disappears, because like The Rock beats him down for so long, and Seth never comes back from that. That didn't make a lot of sense to me because that beatdown was just like very long. And that's fine that the beatdown is long, but where is Seth in all this? Maybe he's getting like, beat up. Uh, at least explain that because like that was the whole thing. Like, oh, we got to watch out for this. Something's going to happen here. And then they do, he does absolutely nothing in the end. He just lets Cody get beat up for, it feels like forever, which is great. Again, too, this is great television, but maybe like show that he's getting beat down by Sol- Solo. Who we saw was just like laying on the ground, done. And then apparently, like, Seth got beat down somewhere. Just a little, little loose ends, you know, like that. Nothing big, but something like that. And I don't know about you, the beginning promo by Cody, not the greatest. Just talking about McAfee and like, oh, let's cheer for Michael Cole. That was not the best way to start. Thankfully, The Rock came out and saved the show. I thought Roman said some really good things about Cody and his promo style last week on the SmackDown promo. Well, just that uh, he's kind of simple with the way he talks. Yeah, and he's like a politician. He's kind of coming out here, saying all the nice things, kissing all the babies, helping all the kids. Like, it's just kind of over the top. I was like, yeah, it is kind of. I think the fans may turn on him at some point, especially if he becomes champion. I think the fans will turn on him very quickly. All these Cody crybabies are going to turn on Cody so quickly. It's the same people that turned on him in when he was in AEW. Well, he's kind of doing the same kind of thing where he's this big hero, but I see a lot of holes in this hero act that he's trying to portray. But The Rock did a great job of, like, when he came out, he didn't talk, and that upset the people so much. So he actually played the role of villain the best on this episode of Raw. The Rock, the People's Champ, will be on Raw coming up Monday night in Brooklyn. Roman will be there. Cody will be there. They will all be there. Yeah, because SmackDown is like a nothing show, no, right? So, well, Raw's they advertised sure they advertised a bunch of stuff for SmackDown, John. They advertised uh, yeah. uh, Jay Uso versus Solo Sokoa, the Andre the Giant right. Battle Royal. Um, a few other matches. They advertise like uh, a few matches for SmackDown next week. So, so, so the quality of what you got tonight, you'll get again next week. Well, with the Andre Battle Royal, that's like semi WrestleMania. It'll be like a SmackDown WrestleMania, though, because I don't think Solo's getting a Mania match. So this will be his Mania match against Jay. And I don't think it's going to be a Mania match quality, <laughs> but. I mean, they'll try to have a good match. Yeah, but I mean, they're doing, they're doing stuff next week on SmackDown. It's not like a nothing show because it is live in Philadelphia, and then I think it's followed by the Hall of Fame. I, I believe you're you're right about that. You're yeah. right. It's not a nothing show, but like the main stuff's happening on Raw next week, like this week. Yeah, which isn't bad. The main stuff with The Rock and everything. Like, The Rock won't be on SmackDown next week. He's going to be on Raw, 
right? I don't think we're expecting yeah. The Rock, but you never know. Because he's going to be at Mania the next day and probably on Sunday, too. Right? Um, next week, John, on this show, we're going to be previewing WrestleMania. Pretty good, right? Next week's the official WrestleMania preview show. Only happens once a year. It's nice. It's going to be a long one, too, because I'm sure there's more matches that haven't been announced that will be announced. So there'll be a lot to go through. Shall I give you a rundown of what we have so far? Um, Yeah? Let's go. All right. Uh, we have the Bloodline, The Rock and Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes and Seth freaking Rollins. If Rhodes and Rollins win, then the Bloodline are all banned from ringside during the Cody Roman match for the title on night two. But if Rock and Roman win, then the title match is Bloodline Rules. So that's that's a big match. That's the biggest match. Does that main event night one? I think they said it already. It does. Or well, they said it's a main event, right? So yeah, I wonder. Probably. I wonder if it closes the show, because to have those guys close the show both nights. But then, does the Rock not close the show? How do how do you not have the Rock at the end, right? And then with Roman and Cody, how does that not end the show on Sunday? Right. I think they have to close the show both both the uh, both nights. Uh, then, of course, night two, we will have Seth freaking Rollins defending his world heavyweight title against Drew McIntyre with CM Punk at ringside on commentary. Is that what they decided? Well, we can talk about that whole segment, but uh, that's what we have as of right now. But that okay. segment felt like it should have been that way. We'll talk about we'll the talk segment about in in a second here after we run through the card. Then we have Roman Reigns against Cody Rhodes on night two for the universal title with the stipulations to be determined. EO Sky defending the WWE Women's Championship against Bayley. Rhea Ripley defending the WWE Women's World Championship against Becky Lynch. Gunta defending the Intercontinental Championship against Samuel Zayn. There will be a six-pack tag team ladder match for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship. The Judgment Day's Finn Balor and Damian Priest, the champions, defending against DIY, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, The Miz and R-Truth, otherwise known as The Awesome Truth, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, The New Day, a-Town Down Under, who qualified tonight on SmackDown, Austin Theory and Grayson Walla. And the New Catch Republic, who also qualified tonight on SmackDown, the team of Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate. So we have all six pack members of this match. I kind of feel like Sean Waltman should be the special referee for this, the six pack challenge, but... Probably not. L.A. Knight versus A.J. Styles one-on-one. -on -one. Jay Uso versus Jimmy Uso one-on-one. -on -one. And a triple threat match for the United States Championship. Logan Paul, the champion. That's right. Logan Paul, the champion, defending against Randy Orton and Kevin Owens in a triple threat match. Uh, Randy Orton's going to be on the Kevin Owens show next week. Friday night on SmackDown. So that's another big deal segment on SmackDown next week. That'll be something. Will Randy RKO Kevin next week on SmackDown? I got to say I was very disappointed with what they did tonight with their match pretty deadly. Wasn't anything great. I mean, it's great to see Randy. It's great to see Kevin. But uh, wasn't very excited with what we got in the end. And I'm not exactly excited for that segment. Like, it's not a great uh, feud what's going on right here. I'm excited for this segment because you know Kevin and Randy, eventually it's going to boil over. So I wonder, does it boil over in the match or do we see it on the Kevin Owens show? Like, do they stay friendly? Because Randy is the guy who's going to RKO anybody, even his best friend. Like, he was teaming with Riddle and RKOing him from time to time, right? Like, it was... 
Randy is mean to his friends because it's just Randy. He's the viper. He hears voices and whatever. So at any point, you figure he's going to hit Kevin Owens with an RKO because they're both going for Logan Paul and want to take the U.S. championship. But he hasn't done it yet. He didn't do it tonight in the match. And next week on SmackDown, there's another opportunity. I just wonder when Randy turns on Kevin or does Kevin turn on Randy? Like what? Because Kevin also is a guy who will turn on you at the drop of a hat. So I think it's interesting in, in that sense. Logan Paul is just kind of there. And also him being there, you know he's kind of, the weak link in this match where Kevin or Randy could probably beat him one-on-one, but like that's how it's been kind of built where he's kind of weak, but will he escape because Kevin and Randy can't figure out who is going to beat Logan Paul and they fight each other and, you know, the normal wrestling triple threat deal. I, I don't mind it. I don't mind the build, and I'm interested in what's going to happen between Randy and Kevin and who's going to turn on who and where it's going to go. And also, um, like, does Logan Paul walk out of WrestleMania still U.S. champion? I don't, like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I kind of feel like he will, but... You know, Randy could easily be champion. Kevin Owens could easily be champion. That's a match that's really, I think, hard to predict. What's your feel on that one? Like, I like the build. I'm into the match. I think the match will be real good, too. You got Randy and Kevin in there, two guys that are going to go in the Hall of Fame, and Logan Paul is an athletic guy. I'm sure they'll practice some stuff and figure it out. If he listens to Randy and Kevin, I think the match will be quite good. Yeah, I'm not worried about the match quality. I, like, Three good workers, so it should be fine, I think. It's just I'm not expecting Randy or Kevin to walk away U.S. champion. They've done that before. They really don't need the U.S. title at this point. If anything, this is just for Logan to somehow walk away just by hook and by crook as champion. Triple threat, so no DQ, so he'll use every trick he possibly can. And uh, I I think he's going to walk away still U.S. champion. Again, the, the titles that are going to change hands, they're going to try to limit a, a bunch of them since I think the bigger ones are going to change. Angelo wanted to know, do you guys see any titles changing hands next weekend? I know you'll tell us next week, but some way too early predictions would be welcome. You want to give something? What do you, I mean, I think... We'll see some title changes for sure. I think the tag team titles will change hands. I'm not sure who's going to wind up with them, but I think we'll see new tag team champions. Yeah, I think Awesome Truth will walk away as the Raw champions. And I'll say maybe uh, Austin Theory and Grayson Waller as SmackDown tag champs. They're splitting up the belts? I think this is a ladder match, right? And they're going to hold up all the belts. Mm-hmm. And I think it just Miz and Truth will grab the Raw ones and the SmackDown ones will get grabbed by another team. I, I think they're going to actually split the titles, yeah. Oh. I hope that doesn't happen. I like that I there's so too, but... one set of tag team champions. I don't think we I agree. need... We don't, we don't need that. Um, But I think the tag team titles will change hands... I kind of feel like Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate might become new tag team champions. I don't know. Um, I don't think well, I, well, I don't I, see I, Sami Zayn beating Gunther though. I think Bailey right. probably beats Io Sky. I think Becky probably beats Rhea Ripley. Really, I'm mm-hmm. not sure about that one. I'm thinking maybe Rhea retains on that one, but I would think maybe Io wins that. Oh no, uh, Bailey would win that one. Sorry. I think Bailey and, and I, Becky might win. Wow. A lot of faces to win. We'll see what happens on Raw. I can't give my yes. prediction for sure. I, you know, I'm, that's, I'm just going with what I'm thinking right now. And Roman and Cody's kind of tough. There's what it's you want tough. and then there's what you think. <laughs> yeah. I know you, you want Roman to win, 
Yeah, I, I feel like Cody will probably. Too. Cody will probably win. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Probably. I don't want it, but this, that's what probably happen. But I also think Seth will not be World Heavyweight Champion. I think Damian Priest will walk away World Heavyweight Champion. Yeah. Yeah, Mania. Yeah, Damian Priest cashing in. Lior is uh, saying that. Says Damian Priest definitely cashing in on Seth, and I think they'll make it seem like it was the final boss behind it to get the title off of Seth, which is a threat that The Rock has been making. I'm hoping. Is The Rock sticking around after Mania? I'm hoping he does. Uh, He's filming a movie, so I don't believe he is, actually. Hollywood, man. I was hoping maybe he'd be around at least, you know, for another week or two after Mania. You know what I'm saying? I got tickets for Raw the week after Mania. I wanted to see The Rock or Punk or, or somebody cool. I really hope that the Raw that comes here isn't like just Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes and, you know? Are you having uh, connection problems, John? Are you with me? I think John's having issues. John A, are you with me? Hiccuping over here, yeah. Okay. Are you okay? For now. Okay. I was just saying that I hope that the Raw here in Montreal has some cool wrestlers because it is the week after Mania, not the night after Mania Raw. That's in Philadelphia. But the following week, it's Raw in Montreal, and I've got tickets. And I was hoping to see, you know, somebody cool like The Rock or CM Punk. And I hope it's not just a show with Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes. They got to give me something a little spicier. Yeah, I don't don't know about that one. I mean, think about it. You think Punk is going to come all the way to Montreal when he's hurt? Uh, I don't think so. Probably and I don't not. think Roman. I don't think Roman's coming. I mean, Roman's no. doing a Raw. He's not supposed to be on Raw. Isn't that the whole point of having a world title is because Roman's not on Raw? I guess. So, not gonna have Roman. Is it gonna be a very weak show? You think? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm worried that the show is gonna be terrible. I'm, I'm not gonna worried. say it's terrible. I'm just like, don't expect the greatest because they're just coming off of WrestleMania, so expect it to be kind of flat a bit. And like a bunch of new stars, possibly so new angles. So that could I mean, be it's fun. Direction. It could, it could be fun. Be. Yeah. Uh, speaking of CM Punk, he cut a very good promo this week. Uh, so did Drew and Seth. I thought Drew and Seth did good work this week in Chicago. CM Punk showing up, talking about how he makes Drew and Seth interesting for the first time in their career. And Seth Rollins saying that uh, he makes CM Punk relevant. Because right now, no one's talking about him, and Seth isn't even thinking about him. Uh, I thought the promo was fantastic. Great stuff. One of the highlights of Raw, for sure. However, Punk talking about his role in the match, being involved somehow. Drew has been talking about Punk. Seth has been talking about Punk. Punk has been talking about both guys, and he wants in, in some capacity. The crowd was chanting referee. It does seem like the perfect spot. I've been saying it for weeks now that CM Punk should be the special referee because, you know, he could call it down the middle because he hates both guys equally. And it would be a great way to have CM Punk still involved in a pretty big way on the card at WrestleMania. But he's got one arm all in a, I don't know, some sort of robot sling. And maybe he's not medically able to be the referee. Even though he dropped down and counted three with the other arm on Raw to prove that he could do it, it seemed like he was just going to be on commentary. Yeah, it was a weird ending to what felt like a promo going in the right direction. And now, I don't know, are we going to see Punk on Raw to rectify this? Are we going to hear from Adam Pierce to give us more information? Like, what's what's the story on this? I, I don't like it. I don't like 
that CM Punk isn't the referee for this match. I don't like that his role in this match is unclear after this promo. I thought the promo was good. I thought they all took some good shots on each other. It was entertaining. It was fun. Good CM Punk style promo. And Seth and Drew had their little shots and they were all right. So it was good. But in the end, I don't really know what we got out of it. There was no real fruit from the promo. No resolution. To me, what we really got out of this was one of Punk's best promos, I think, since he's come back. It feels like we keep saying that almost all the time. But I felt because it was in Chicago, I felt Punk was kind of just out there and like, oh, I'm going to say some things. I don't think they probably went over it beforehand. And I think a lot of what he said may have upset people. And I think the crowd was pretty much on Punk's side. And they wanted to go in a certain direction. And I think they had an idea of what they wanted to do with the promo. But the crowd wanted to go a different direction. And Punk was going in their direction as well with him being the referee. And um, you could tell they were really pushing it. They did it wrong, though, too. Like, the way they... The direction of it was not pulled off. It wasn't executed well. Where Drew's the one, the heel... Drew McIntyre, the heel, is telling Punk, oh, you should be a commentator. It's his idea. So, in the end, Punk is supposed to agree with the heel? Like, that was just poor writing, whoever came up with that idea. And then they have Seth come out and say, like, oh, what should Punk do? What's that's the people? And then the people went against exactly what they wanted. And then he's like, oh, that's his, like, that's not his counting arm. And then Punk... You know, because he's feeling the moment and he's feeling the people that goes down and counts to three and makes Rollins look like an absolute idiot. But I don't think he cared because he went into business for himself a little bit there, which is fine because that was entertaining. That's what got people talking. And to me, one of the best parts was when Seth asked him, you want to know what I think about you? And then Punk said, nope, that was (laughs) tremendous. You never see stuff like that. So that that was great. Punk had a lot of great lines in this. My favorite Talking part. About... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you're probably going to say the exact same I'm going to say, right? It's the whole, like, chosen one thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that exposed something that I didn't know was a thing. So yeah. Drew says, I'm the chosen one. I've always been the chosen one, you know? And Punk goes, all right, Drew, you say you're the chosen one. Well, who called you that? Who gave you that name? Why don't you, big man, you're all tough. Well, who gave you the name? And Drew's just like. Uh, yep. Uh, Got him. Uh. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, well, so for those that don't know, Vince McMahon called him the chosen one on TV. He's like, he's the future He's the chosen one, Drew McIntyre. And everybody was like, huh? And this was like way, way, way back. Skinny Drew, like not Jack Drew, childlike Drew. He looked like a baby if you see that promo compared to who he is right now. But so it was Vince McMahon and then CM Punk is like, why don't you say who called you that? And I was like, well, it's Vince. Why can't Drew just say it was Vince? And then Drew didn't say, and I was like, oh, I guess they can't say his name on TV, which is a very Vince thing. Like, certain names you're not allowed to say on TV. Vince always had a list of names and things you weren't allowed to say. And that whole thing is alive and well still in the post-Vince era in the WWE, except it now applies to Vince himself which is crazy and hilarious because it is kind of like like it's a thing that he created that is now being used against him, Vince, whose name I can say all the time, all day. I could even do the impression if I wanted to, but it seems in poor taste in these times. But isn't that funny? 
How, like, they're not allowed to say Vince's name? Nuts. Well, it created a tremendous moment for us to, to watch and enjoy. I, I was a huge fan of this promo. I, I think not only did that get a lot of attention, the main thing I saw, like, before I even saw it after it aired, was the fact that he mentioned that he listens to Jim Cornette's podcasts. Yeah. For, he said. For my timeline, that blew up. The experience, I'm more of a, he's like, oh, Pat McAfee, I don't listen to your to your show. I'm more of an experience and a drive through guy. And I'm like, experience and a drive through I'm like, Joe Rogan experience? Like, what is he talking about? And I was like, I was like, oh, those in the name of Jim Cornette's podcast, the Jim Cornette experience and the Jim Cornette drive through He has two different shows that are basically the same where he talks for like four or five hours about all the wrestling. He does it like twice a week, and they're called different things. I'm not sure why they're called different things. But I know he has two different ones. And that's that's what Punk drops. So I was like, oh, Punk. So Punk listens to that. And then I saw Jim Cornette post a picture of himself in a CM Punk t-shirt, which I thought was funny. Which, of course, why wouldn't you? Um, So, yeah. Punk is a listener to the Jim Cornette uh, shows. And he said that on Raw. Well, Something. again, you talk about names that you know are kind of like banned in a sense. I remember when McAfee mentioned Cornette, they immediately changed the subject once he mentioned that Cornette was uh, a commentator with uh, Michael Cole. Qu- quickly changed it because they don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. Probably didn't help that like what, what's the name? Kevin Dunn was probably still there and doesn't didn't like him, but maybe he's got less hate. But he still has Cornette still has haters in WWE. So the fact that Punk will go out there and say what he wants. It, it goes to show you, you never know what you're going to get with Punk. And that's what makes him so great. Is that you just don't know what he's going to say. Who hates Punk? Who hates Cornette still in WWE, though? Oh, I'm sure a bunch of the talent do, without question. Like, Kevin Owens, easily. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I have a feeling probably Becky doesn't like him either because that whole thing that happened when she got pregnant, remember that? Like, the whole thing. Oh, he said some derogatory things about how she shouldn't have been pregnant at that time because she was, she was important to the business. I think there was other things too, and there was a cartoon picture of her and all that. And, like, oh. I think a lot of Seth, – Seth got really mad about it. So, Yeah. He's got a bunch of haters. Mm-hmm. But again, Punk doesn't care. Punk will say what he wants. Again, that that's what's so great about Punk. It doesn't matter like if it's not PC or if it's not like what everyone loves, like he's going to say what he how he feels. Yeah. Um it was a big line to drop in WWE, but if he would have said that while he was still in AEW, it would have been nuclear. Right? <laughs> I think he would have got booed a lot more, I think. Oof. I would think it would have been heavy. And that, <laughs> with here, I, I feel like that kind of snuck under the radar, kind of thing. You know, he could say it, and not everyone understands it right away. Yeah. AEW, that would have been instant reaction, and I, I think probably more negative than positive. I mean, if you have heard the way Jim Cornette talks about the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, yeah, you know. It's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. But again, that's, this is punk in Chicago. That's one of the places so where I, he loses me. You know, like I like Cornette to a certain extent, and I, I, you know, I respect his opinion as a guy who's dedicated his entire life to pro wrestling and is a historian. A lot about pro wrestling. I don't have to agree with everything that he thinks about wrestling or all his opinions or anything like that. I think he's misinformed with a lot of things about how, well, whatever. I I think that we like different things in pro wrestling. But as far as like a a real fighting and a submission grappling type of uh, understanding, like I've heard him talk about UFC and this guy could beat up this guy and all of that. And I'm like, no, that's crazy talk. You know, like it's, it's just 
sometimes like his ideas of who would win in a real fight are just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, and that kind of paints his view about pro wrestling in a way. And I go, well, that, you know, it's just not, not how the world works because he doesn't have the exp- like, he's not a MMA guy. You know what I'm saying? Oh, there's I guess certain... like it is a different view. Yeah, but he, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of a specific example. I just know that I've heard him say a couple of things where I go, well, that's just not true. Like, I don't know, like, he says something maybe when Ronda Rousey was wrestling, how somebody big like Nia Jax would squash Ronda Rousey like a bug, and it's not believable that Ronda would beat her, something crazy like that. And I'm like, what? You know? What are you talking about? In a well, real fight, it's, funny. It, it's a skill thing. It's not about a size thing. And I, yeah, I think there's some of that. I'm not sure if it was that exact thing that he said. It's just, you know, when you're not watching MMA and then you try to go, well, this person would win this person in this fight and this is how these things go in fighting. When you don't have an understanding of actual fighting, it's kind of like you you may say things that expose how you don't really understand what, what fighting really is. And in pro wrestling, you know, it is kind of a simulated fight. Um, and also he has some views about women's wrestling that I don't really uh, like. He says some things that are pretty derogatory sometimes, and I go, come on, man. What's going on? But, you know, he's been around wrestling for so long, and he was a great manager. So, And he's an entertaining podcaster. Like, I don't think his podcast is necessarily bad. I just don't like some of the things he says. I don't really listen to a show, though. Like, I have I have listened to it, but there's so many podcasts out there that I do listen to that I just don't have time. I don't listen to a lot of wrestling podcasts these days in general. You got Yankees to watch. I understand. We all understand. You got a baseball um, season to go through. I'm not just I'm not listening to Yankees podcasts though. Wow. That's surprising. I don't actually listen to any Yankees podcasts. Very surprising. Mm-hmm. A lot of comedy podcasts um, and some other stuff. Some wrestling. You mentioned a couple. You mentioned music. I could ch- I could check. I can't even, like, I can't think of what I'm, the podcasts I've listened to. I like Matt and Shane's secret podcast. It's a Shane Gillis, who's a comedian. I like him. He's funny. Sometimes I listen to Joe Rogan. The History of Curb Your Enthusiasm I've been listening to with uh, Jeff Garland and Susie Esman. Susie and Jeff from Curb Your Enthusiasm. They have a podcast called The History of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I've been listening to that. And, uh, you know, once in a while, Joe Rogan, he had a show recently that was good. Oh, he's got Joey Diaz on the latest episode. I'll, I'll listen to that. And then if Jericho has somebody good, I'll listen to that too. He had Will Ospreay on uh, like a couple weeks ago. That was pretty good. That's what I'm listening to. And Drink Champs. They have Schoolboy Q on on the latest episode, and I've been listening to that because I like Schoolboy Q. He's a good rapper, and Drink Champs is a very good podcast. So you see it's a varied thing. There's some rap podcasts. There's a little wrestling, and then there's some comedy in there too, John. A lot of interest. I thought there was a – wasn't there a Sopranos uh, podcast? No. Is that over? I never listened to a Sopranos podcast in my life. Well, maybe a little bit with... uh, I listened to... No, that's not true. I listened to Christopher and Bobby Bacala had a podcast, and I listened to a few episodes of that, but it wasn't my favorite. I didn't love it. I didn't stick it out. Um, Uh Uh-oh. Did I just lose Johnny again? Johnny just froze out. Why do we keep losing Johnny tonight? Johnny's having some issues. Oof. What was that sound? That was a weird sound. Johnny! See, I knew he'd come back. Glitching we'll out tonight, John. You all right? Uh, you know, the internet, that's what you get for 60 right. bucks uh, a month. It happens. 
Um, okay, so you did not like Pretty Deadly beating Randy Orton and Kevin Owens tonight? I thought it was hilarious. Logan Paul hitting the knockout punch with the brass knuckles and then hiding under the ring. Randy went after Logan, attacked him after the match, but then Pretty Deadly stopped Randy, and then Logan ran off, and uh, Owens hit the stunner on Pretty, and Randy hit the RKO on Deadly, or vice versa. I'm not really sure. And then Randy chased Logan Paul out of the arena. And then Kevin Owens, like, trailed behind. It was weird. It was, like, Randy chasing and Kevin Owens, like, I guess slowly walking behind Randy. Like, ah, you get him and I'll catch up. Um, But I thought it was pretty funny to see Pretty Deadly beat Randy and Kevin Owens tonight. Come on. That was hilarious. That was the biggest win of their lives. I I guess, but the match wasn't much of anything special thought it was very simple and not really entertaining and just out of nowhere, oh, there's the finish. It's a little cheap from behind kind of thing and there was a weird spot too where they're like, they were trying to make a tag and they were in the wrong corner and like, oh, he's not holding the tag rope. There's no tag. Where there's never holding like a tag rope almost ever on tags yet in that particular instant they said, oh, no tag rope can't make a tag without that like, you've seen it many times, and I've complained many times about that, the whole, like, they don't use the tag rope. They're just in the corner, not holding the tag rope. So I was kind of upset about that, and I just didn't think the match was anything special. And you're going to beat Randy and Kevin in a match that wasn't particularly anything great? I thought it was kind of a waste, almost. I mean, it was just to advance the story. It wasn't really a match that meant anything. And the fact that Pretty Deadly won is just funny to me. I don't know. They crack me up more than, like, you don't like them, and they make me laugh, so I I don't know. I got more enjoyment out of this than you did, I guess. I I think you advance the story without them having to do that. You just have to have Logan Paul do a cheat, and that's it. But I guess you you got to screw them over, too, I guess. Why not? You didn't have to do that. It's not like Randy and Kevin are some tag team. They, I mean, Kevin can drop the the match here. Well, who cares? He just got hit with a foreign object by Logan Paul. You put over the fact that Logan Paul could be dangerous. He could use the foreign object in the triple threat match. It's not bad. Like, again, I didn't hate it. I liked I, it. I just didn't think it was anything great. It was, I mean, it wasn't the rock in the rain beating up Cody Rhodes, but what can be, you know? We're spoiled. Um, Jade Cargill came to the ring to sign her contract. She's on SmackDown. It's about damn time, she says, and the storm has arrived. It was kind of a lackluster appearance for Jade, but she returned later in the night when Bianca Belair beat Dakota Kai in the main event. Damage Control attacked Bianca, but Naomi came down trying to make the save, but she got beat up, and then Jade Cargill slowly walked to the ring and she kicked somebody. She kicked Asuka and hit a power bomb on Dakota and then hit her finisher on Kyrie. And then Bianca and Naomi stood side by side with Jade Cargill to close out SmackDown. So Jade um, making her presence known here on SmackDown and it's going to lead to something at WrestleMania. You would imagine Jade, Naomi, Bianca versus Dakota, Asuka, and um, Kyrie, possibly? Or just Jade and Bianca? Or Jade and Naomi versus Asuka and Kyrie for the tag titles? Like, I'm not sure what they do. I think it's going to be a six woman tag quite frankly. That's the way it looked to close out SmackDown. It'll be Jade, Bianca, and Naomi versus Asuka, Kyrie, and Dakota. I think that's where we're headed. So Jade will be at WrestleMania in a match. I think. It's weird because the promo that she cut, to me it seemed like she was going to be a heel saying that everyone should fear kind of thing that she was doing. And it's very simple and short, and like I didn't think we were going this direction, but then she came out at the end. I'm like, okay, I guess we are going this direction, but it's also weird because it should be a tag team title match. 
and now you're not going to do the titles. It's kind of like, didn't they do this a couple years ago too? Or was it last year? I think it may have been last year. Or was Becky, Lita, and Trish? And they made Becky and Lita the tag champs, but they did a six woman tag instead. How yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing, but I think it's just to fit as many people at WrestleMania as possible. And that's where we're going. Um, and then, like, but again, we have another segment where it's like, okay, what do we accomplish here? I guess we'll find out next week on SmackDown, or maybe they'll do it on Twitter. Um, and then Legato del Fantasma cut a promo in the ring, and they introduced Dominic Mysterio, who's hanging out with them because they all hate Rey Mysterio together. And then Rey Mysterio came out with the LWO, and he's got Carlito and Zelina Vega with them. And Ray's like, how about a tag team match at WrestleMania? And they're like, well, who are you going to have with you? And he's like, the newest member of the LWO, Dragon Lee. And then everybody fights. And then again, I'm not sure, like, what's the match? Is it Santos and Dominic versus Ray and Dragon Lee? Is it all of the LWO versus all of Legado del Fantasma? What is the match? Yeah, it's uh, Ray and Dragon Lee against um, Santos and Dominic. That's the match. Okay. What? How come the other people don't the get crowd. to wrestle? Uh oh. Um, that's a great question. Why well, don't? I don't know why. You know, you're you're right. Like that should be the other guys. I felt the crowd was saying Carlito. They were chatting for Carlito, and they went in a totally different direction with it. And we're just doing a tag match because I think a lot of WrestleMania is kind of overbooked, and they're probably going to have another big tag match. So they're trying to, I think, limit those big multi-man matches. And they'll be involved anyways, right? Because remember Ray and Dominic last year? It was one-on-one, but wasn't there, like, multiple interference in that match? So... Expect that again this match. Plus, it's weird. The faces, the LWO, they outnumber the heels. They do. Weird. They do, right? So, wait. There's so many guys, it's hard to keep track. Exactly. There's Ray, Carlito, and now Dragon Lee, um, Joaquin Del... No, Joaquin Wild, Cruz Del Toro... And then, wait, Ray, Carlito, yes. Dragon Lee, Joaquin, Cruz. They got five right. plus Zelina, six. And then Legato right. is Santos. Oh, yeah, they got four. Santos, Angel, Umberto, Dominic. And then with, uh, what is her name? Electra Lopez. Electra Lopez. So, it's yeah, it's six on five. It's not fair. Why did they add Dragon Lee? It was weird. It should have been Carlito. The fans wanted it. I don't know why they went. I guess because they have high hopes for Dragon Lee, and he's had some good matches. I get it, but it's odd to have the faces with the advantage. It makes it feel like it's not fair for the heels. I think they're probably doing a tag team match because the Bobby Lashley... Street Profits BFAB group is going to wrestle the the Carrion Cross Scarlet AOP team. I think that's going to be the eight person with a, you know, eight person tag at WrestleMania, the big group tag match at Mania. I think they do Street Profits, Bobby, and BFAB against AOP, Carrion Cross, and Scarlet in a match at Mania. I think yeah. that's where we're headed, especially after what we saw tonight with the Theory and Waller beating the Street Profits from a distraction because Bobby and B-Fab were beaten up by Carrying Cross and Scarlet. And then AOP and Carrying Cross beat up the Street Profits after the match, and Bobby Lashley came out and he got beat up too. I think we're headed towards some sort of match between those two groups at Mania. We were talking before the show, uh, they have 11 matches announced so far and the rumor was seven matches per night so we need three more matches to make it 14 
to have uh, seven per night. And the three more matches, I think probably we have Ray and the the Ray Mysterio match, right? Ray and Dragon Lee versus Santos and Dominic. Then we also have um, the Bobby Lashley team versus the Karrion Cross team match. And the uh, six-woman tag with Bianca, Naomi, and Jade against Damage Control. I think that is, those are the three extra matches which would make it a 14-match card at WrestleMania. The matches are there. They just haven't been made official yet. Right? Are you with me? I'm I'm not too excited for that. I, I don't know about you. No. You heard me say that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Good. that excited <laughs> for it either. It's not a lot of great stuff. Um, you know, it, it feels like they're just trying to fill the card. Yeah, I think, you know, past the Rock and Roman and Cody and all of that stuff, it's pretty thin this year. They're really depending heavily on the main events, which need to deliver. And I think they probably will. But the rest of the card does feel like we're kind of going to be waiting around for The Rock to show up. Which is fine. But there's not a ton of really exciting stuff. Like even Gunther versus Sami Zayn, I don't know. And I don't know where they're headed. They seem to be headed in a new direction with it. Uh, Sami just lost to Bronson Reed on Raw. And Chad Gable's like, you got your head, got to get your head in the game. He seems to be like coaching Sammy, like Sammy's going to be the new Otis and Alpha Academy. I don't know what the hell's going on there. Well, they're trying something different with that. I, I don't mind that because it's like, I felt Sammy wasn't going to win this match. But now they're going this direction. It's like, well, he should win this match, but it's different. So maybe it's him losing, losing, and just lose again. It could happen too. It could be that story. I guess. What's the deal with Chad Gable? Well, it's another new member for Alpha Academy. He's growing his group. Okay. I wanted it to be a triple threat with Gable in the match, not in Sammy's corner. Yeah, it seems like that's what's going to happen. If you'd be in the corner or something, you have Alpha Academy in the corner. It kind of sucks. Um,. And then Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch cut a promo on Raw that I thought was pretty good. I, I like Becky getting emotional, talking about her father, never meeting her daughter, and all of that stuff. Uh, I thought it was a good promo from Rhea and Becky, especially Becky, though. What did you think? You didn't. Like I it. wasn't a fan of it. No, I didn't like it. Like, look, the whole crying thing, like, all she said was her daughter's name. And then she started crying off that, like... That's way too like easy. Come on, like she didn't like say anything threatening or anything. Mm. Like that, to me, was like mm. you're, you're way too emotional. Mm. And you're 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 a parent. It's different, mm -hmm. I guess, right? Mm -hmm. But like you know, I say your son's name. You don't you know start bawling like if you say it, you're good. But if we're if we're about to fight. If you're somebody that I don't like and you're saying some things that are mean to me and in the mean things you include my, one of my children's names, my son or my daughter, I mean, the fact that Becky didn't slap her and attack her just at that moment is a, a bit of a surprise. I, nope. No, I get it. I, I got it. I was right there with her. So, yeah, maybe it's different, Sean. Maybe it's different. Because Rhea says the name, drops it like it's nothing. She doesn't have kids. And Becky's like, maybe it's a joke to you, but listen, it's not to me. And don't you ever say anything. Don't ever talk about my... Like, that was... No, I got that 100%. I was there with Becky on that one. So I guess it's, a again, different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, you say anything about my kid? I mean, any man, you say something about my kids? <sighs> Goodness, I don't. I don't think you get that emotional though about it. Like you get emotional probably a different way. Do you see me right now? I'm ready to kill somebody. I'm ready to kill nobody. 
no nobody said anything to me and i'm like yo let me i will bludgeon somebody i will dismember you know i'll take him apart at the joint <laughs> what did ralphie say i'll take him apart at the joints with him still alive they didn't let him do it anyhow you're, you're pretty good at remembering all the classic lines oh sopranos I watch it a lot. It's like a, it's Literally. the Bible. Hmm? That's good though. You have good memory for certain things. But you've also watched it many times. Oh, yeah, well that's well. it. Yeah, that's it, man. I've just seen it so much. Um, where are we at here? Oof. There's still more raw left. Wait a second. There was. Not much of the women's content. I think there's just one more thing with the women's. What is happening here? Oh, my God. The Yankees have... Oh, my God. There's like a rally happening in Houston. Oh, my on? God. Houston's defense has fallen apart in the eighth, and the Yankees have scored a ton of runs. It was a one nothing ball game. They tied it 1-1. And now, what was that? Soto. Oh, that's a double. Oh, man. The Yankees are killing it. Was it 6 1, 8 1? I think wow, it's 6 Houston 1. Fell apart. Is it 6 1 wow. now? Or... Hold on. Did he drive in a run? No. It's hey, Dave, 6 1. Here's my parlay. On the prelims, the I pick heck? every underdog to win. AIAJ, get oh. out of here, AIAJ. Nobody asked you to be here. Jeez. We have actual AJ in the chat for a little bit. The Yankees are beating the Astros six to one right now in Houston after beating them yesterday. The Yankees are winning right now six one. I was watching wow. the game and SmackDown before, and it was a real close one. Rodon had kind of a rocky start, but he only let one run go by. Uh, a few hits, a few walks. It was kind of shaky, but he made it out alive. And the Yankees scoring runs this season. 6-1 in the eighth. <sighs> well, it's good that you win, but none of your starters have won any games, though. Um, Who cares? Okay, fine. <laughs> we talked about this. You can't rely on your bullpen forever, but uh, we have a pretty good bullpen, and our bats—we <laughs> uh, can rely on that. We can rely on the bats, which are excellent. We're changing the goalpost. It's okay. <laughs> what? A uh, shout out to Harold Schneider, number one fan. Drop in the super chat. Thank you, Harold, member of the team. Always a great supporter. Drop in the $10 Super Chat. You are the Super Chat leader of the night. Thank you, Harold. Very happy about the Yankees right now, John. Very happy. To take to possibly take two out of three from the Astros in Houston and maybe, maybe tomorrow go for the sweep of the Astros in Houston to start the season. I mean. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then we roll into Arizona, and then, like, who knows what we might do to the Diamondbacks who went to the World Series last year. That is a good point. The Jays mm -hmm. are doing pretty good. I mean, they're good, but, like... Well, I meant what AJ was saying, actually. The Yankees are good, too. What's AJ saying? The Blue Jays are off to a good start. Like, it's going to be a tough division. The Blue Jays. Hey. We'll see. I look forward to playing the Blue Jays. I love when the Yankees play the Blue Jays because they're always on uh, Canadian TV, so I get to watch them uh, e easier. Easier than normal. Although I do have the oh. game on right now in front of me. It is 6-1 Yanks. 6-1 Yanks. Top of the ninth. What? It's a four-game series, apparently. What is? Not three. Uh, against the Astros. I don't They're think playing so. four games. No, I don't think so. 
Well, we just saw someone said in the chat, so it must be true. Who said these? <laughs> oh, yeah, it is a four-game set. No, they are right. Correct. Uh, Saturday and Sunday they're playing. Yep, and then straight to Arizona. Yikes. No off day? What the hell, man? I guess it's an afternoon game and then maybe a night game on Monday, but still. Yankees don't play at home until next Friday when they face the Blue Jays. John Carlos Stanton takes one deep and gone. Home run. Big G. 7 1 Yankees. It's good for you, man. Good start. Big G. First homer of the season. You love to see it. Ooh. Soto, Stanton, Judge, Verdugo. <sighs> Try and stop him. Try and stop him. Yeah. It's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a fun season, Johnny North. Oh, I'm so happy baseball's back. I am so happy. And the Yankees right, winning you. games, too, is really nice. Oof. They have a good chance of going, getting a wild card. A, a very good chance, I think. Yeah, or winning the division. You know, whatever comes first. Oof, good luck. Good luck. Again, it's a tough division. You know that. I know, but, I mean, have you seen the lineup the Yankees are putting out there? It's pretty good. Ryan said it best. Yeah, well, Ryan's probably not a Yankee fan. I mean, yeah, I know we need, uh, you know. Be realistic. Hopefully Garrett Cole comes back at some point this season and he is who he is and uh, everything will be fine. I mean, uh, yeah, we didn't have a great start yesterday from Cortez. Didn't have an amazing start today from Rodon, but it was not that bad. It was, you know, fine. One run, one earned run over like five innings for a first start of the year. I think that's fine. I think that's respectable. He got himself out of jams. As long as you get yourself out of the trouble you put yourself into, fine. He put himself into a little trouble. He got out. Some pitchers do that. Some pitchers need the pressure. It's fine with me. As long as they win. That's all I care about. But I don't think Rodone had a terrible start tonight. I think giving up one run over five innings is actually pretty nice. And the Yankees keep hitting. What was that, a double from Anthony Volpe? Yep, Volpe with a double. How do you like the apples? They're good apples. They're Volpe apples. Double to right field, Anthony Volpe. Sends Verdugo from first to third. Volpe stays on second base. I don't think we have any outs in the ninth inning right now. Nope. No, one out. Second and third for the Yankees right now with one out, Johnny North. Phenomenal. Well, I love it. It's a good start. 2-0 to start the season. That's pretty good. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, okay, back to the wrestling talk. Uh, I think we're good with WWE stuff. WrestleMania's next week. We'll be previewing WrestleMania next Friday night here on Wrestling Uncensored. And um, we'll be doing a post show for night one of WrestleMania on uh, the night of night one on Saturday. So WrestleMania night one post show coming up Saturday right after WrestleMania night one. And then the night two post show I think we're going to aim for a Monday evening because Sunday night, you know, some people have to wake up very early Monday morning. So we're just not going to be able to do a late night Sunday night post show. So we'll do it Monday evening before Monday night raw. So we'll get you all caught up with what happened at mania. Give you our review on Monday evening. That'll be the WrestleMania night two post show here on the ringside report network. Johnny North, AEW Dynamite did another show this week, as they always do. It was in Quebec City to a very small crowd, which did not surprise me because they couldn't sell out the 
Bell Center. They had a very small crowd here for the Bell Center. And Montreal is a much bigger city population-wise than Quebec City. Same province, much smaller town. And they drew far fewer people. And the internet was like, oh, look at this, another bad venue for AW. And I'm like, yeah, what? people expect them to have like a bigger crowd than they did at the Bell Center? So it made sense, but you could tell how empty the building was just by watching on TV. They didn't show you the empty seats, but it just felt quiet and dead in that building, just from the TV perspective. Well, we've been over this before when they came here. Like, they can draw a good crowd for, like, not WWE. You know, not for WWE to draw between three to 4,000. That's pretty good. Problem is, three to 4,000 in a 17,000 seat arena, it looks really bad. So that's why a lot of it's darkened off, tarped off. And we saw it at the Bell Center. They had maybe 7,000, but that's 21,000 seat arena. So kind of look bad in certain areas. But again, 7,000 in Montreal, when you're not WWE, still not bad. But maybe don't go for those arenas. Like, get a small arena, like a 10,000 seat arena. I think that would be better. And maybe in some cases, 5,000 seat arena. I think it would look much better on TV. What is the capacity of the uh, Centre Vidéotron in Quebec City? 18,000 sure seats. Okay, I thought 17. But okay, 18, fine. See, that's it. Smaller venues. That's really the key. And, like, again, three to 4,000 is not bad. Just, you know, you need a smaller venue. Yeah. Uh, it did feel empty just acoustic-wise from the sound of the building. Um, the show itself was okay. It started off with the match that I was hoping to see. Will yep. Ospreay versus Katsuyori Shibata. I thought the match was solid. You know, it didn't blow me away, but I thought it was a really good match. Probably match of the night. And uh, Osprey won with the Hidden Blade. Solid finish. I, You know, I thought they might have done a little bit more, but I understand it's a TV match. They can't go all out. Uh, it was, I, you know, it was what it was. I just want to say that I like that they showed the history that they had in New Japan. I like that a lot because I didn't have much to go off of in this match. It's like Osprey, okay, he's the new upcoming guy in Shibata. Like, well, he comes and goes. Like, we see him every so often. So the fact that they gave us a little bit of history at least gave us something for this match. Like, oh, Shibata beat Osprey before, but it was a long time ago. Now let's see what Osprey can, can do. There wasn't a lot of heat in this match. But at least you had some good action back and forth. And Osprey had that thing where it's like, oh, I didn't beat him before, but I can beat him now kind of thing. So for an opening match, it was fine. Not like an amazing match, but for an opener, I thought it was fine. Yeah. It was really what I was looking to see on the show, though. So the rest of it, I was like, yeah, what else do you got? What? And the rest of the show I, honestly, was, I don't know. Honestly, I think the four-way women's match may have been the best match. To, I I think it was. That was a very good women's match, that four-way women's match. It was all right. I mean, you know, most time the women's matches in AEW don't get any reactions whatsoever, and they're not very exciting. This was actually exciting start to finish. Yeah, you really liked it? I thought it was fine. I mean, I wasn't... Uh... I don't know, this whole episode of Dynamite was like, yeah, it was fine, but it wasn't, I don't know. I didn't love that match. I thought Osprey and Shibata was the best match of the night. Oh, yeah, I thought, I thought it was okay, and, you know, it it met my expectations, but I didn't really have any expectations for that four-way women's match. It was like, wow, this is really good. Again, mm -hmm. most women's matches don't get much reaction whatsoever, so the fact that they always had action going it helped it was a four-way, obviously, but it always felt like you needed to keep watching that match. And I was excited to see, like, how is this going to end? And I thought Mercedes was good on commentating. 
as well. It felt like she was actually into the match. Like she actually cared about the match. Yeah. I didn't love her commentary though. I was looking for she more. Was she was she didn't say much. Well, she said a couple of things about how like, you know, that move or that wrestler, like she was actually like knew what was going on. She called, I think, Sky Blue's finish before it even happened. Oh, she's going she's setting up for it. Like it shows you that like at least she kinda cares or is at least in tune with what they're doing or have been doing. Yeah, but that's not what you're supposed to do on commentary as a wrestler. You're not supposed to be like a good analyst for wrestling. You're supposed to go out there and cut an electrifying promo that almost takes away from the match or enhances it in some way. That's like she didn't do what I want a wrestler to do on commentary, which is say some things where you go, oh, man, you hear her say this, you hear her say that. That was really funny when she said this. This was entertaining. It was just like, oh, there's that move. That's very good. I know how to do that. It was like, all right. You know about wrestling. That's cool. Obviously, you know about wrestling. It was just like kind of flat. Didn't have any pizzazz. And the whole thing, getting people to chant CEO is kind of like, I don't want to chant CEO ever for anybody. I don't love it. I'm not loving it. I don't like the name. Mercedes Monet. The Monet is just like, it's corny. The promos haven't been great. The commentary I didn't really love. Eh. I like Sasha Banks. I think she's a really good wrestler. I don't think promos have ever been her strong suit. Ever. Ever. Well, more as a heel, I think. Yeah, much better as a heel. But even then, of the four horsewomen, she's the weakest promo. Of Bailey, Becky, Charlotte, Sasha's the weakest promo. Don't argue with me. Who? Come on. What? I'm going to say Charlotte with her promo is not what? always the best. Charlotte, come on. Now. Right now, last time you saw Charlotte, promo-wise, compared to Sasha Banks at her best. Like, come on. S Charlotte at her best? Can you name me, like, a great Charlotte promo? I don't know. Just consistency. It's not, like, anything specific, but it's, you know, how she presents herself, the way she says things. I, I don't know. Every time she comes out on SmackDown with a microphone, she's pretty solid. Yankees just won, by the way. Ball game over. 7-1 final. Oh, congrats. Good. 2-0. Two, oh. two more to go. Yep. No, 2-0, uh, oh, 160 more to go, John. Well, you you go one series at a time here, right? Like, Nope. Get through Houston. No. No, we're trying to win every single game. Every single okay. day. Every game Good luck with that. forever. No losses. Well, whatever. If you're trying to win them all, then, you know. You have a better chance. You're not trying to lose any of them, John. It's not like, ah, let's win a bunch of them, but we'll probably lose some. It's like, no, let's try to win every game. And then when you lose, you're like, damn, let's get them next time. 160 more wins is the goal. It's not going to be attained. It's not a realistic goal, but I think it should be the goal. Try to win every day. No? Am I wrong? I mean... I don't know if they're built for that. I, I think a lot of them get hurt. I mean, Soto almost like walked out of the game, right? Didn't he at some point? So, yeah, he I, was. I uh, it looked like he was walking around, but he's fine. He finished the game. He's totally fine. He's fine for now. Yo, but again, why are you in, trying to curse me? You've lived this before. You should know this. Like injuries happen. It, it's it's a part of the the cycle. It's it's sports. It happens. You got to prepare for that. And you're going to find out how good their depth is. Yo, shut up, John. How's your Red Sox doing? I think they did very well against the Marners, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Did they beat the Marners last night? I'm legit asking. I don't know how they're doing. Well, they won But they're not night. as good as the Yankees, and they won't do as well as the Yankees, so deal with that. 
We'll see. They don't play them this month, so wait. That's and see. too bad. Red Sox losing right now, one nothing in Seattle. Let's see it with what which inning exactly? Top what, eight. First or second? Top eight, okay. Top eight. Yankees just won, by the way, 7-1. I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, just so you know, the Yankees won. The Yankees won. Elsewhere on AEW Dynamite, Swerve Strickland in the main event. I thought that match was pretty good. He beats Konosuke Tokeshita to become the AEW number one contender for the world championship. Samoa Joe showing up after the match. It'll be Samoa Joe versus Swerve at AEW Dynasty. They're throwing Swerve at Joe again. Last time it was the triple threat with Hangman. This time it's one-on-one for the belt. I have a hard time believing that Swerve will not beat Takeshita. Or, sorry, Swerve will not beat Samoa Joe this time around. Does he beat him? How many times does Swerve get a title shot before he finally wins? And how many times can you throw Swerve at Joe and have him not win before the fans start to lose faith in swerve yeah it's a good question i mean you could be right about this for it's like maybe now's the time to switch it but i could see them dragging another pay-per-view this is the problem with them having monthly pay-per-views i could see them drag stuff out or swerve they might even do like a wwe kind of thing three pay-per-views for a feud you know how we get almost like the same main event. So I could see it being Joe and Swerve again, double or nothing, just a stipulation match in at the end of May. Yeah. I could see Swerve winning and then having a rematch with Joe at double or nothing too. It could happen, yeah, sure. Tiebreaker. I'd rather... Then do that like on a dynamite or something, but mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just if Swerve loses again, you know, how yeah, do you sell it? Over, it's fine. How do you sell the other match? Like, how does how do you have Joe win? Like, make it make sense to me, John. How do you have Joe win at Dynasty? where you can sell Swerve as a legit, credible contender again for a rematch of Double or Nothing. Joe cheats? Well, there'd be some kind of, sort of interference. Lights go out or something, and someone pops up. That way you have a cage match in May or some sort of stipulation where you don't have to worry about people interfering. Maybe make it a street fight. Street fights is probably not the best of ideas, but something where it's like you don't have to worry about whatever happened at Dynasty and then double or nothing, you'll be fine. Does Hangman cost Swerve the belt at Dynasty? Sure, that could happen. That's a, that's an interesting idea. It would make sense. That or Undisputed Kingdom. So they have Heat 2 with Joe. If he would Joe, but not Hangman, or sorry, or Swerve. Yeah, but you know, wires get crossed, signals mixed up. Okay. Um, the Young Bucks beat Private Party to advance to the semifinals of the tag team title tournament. The tag team titles are vacant, of course, and the Young Bucks now in the semifinals, where they will face Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta, who also advanced to the semifinals, beating Matt Taven and Mike Bennett on Dynamite this week. Uh, the Bucks botched their finisher. You know, it's funny. Like, I actually thought this was a pretty good match, Bucks yeah. against Private Party. I actually There was a lot of good sequences that they had. I mean, clearly, they've wrestled each other many times before in the past because they had some very good spots with each other. It's just that finish got plastered everywhere. It'll be on Botchamania, I'm sure. And that would be the only part people remember for the match, which is kind of a shame because they had some very good moments, which will be forgotten. Yeah. The match itself was good, you know, as far as a wrestling match, but you kind of figured the Bucks would win the whole time. 
given the momentum they have right now, it'd be crazy to have them lose in the opening round of the tag title tournament. I think the Bucks are probably going to the finals and will face FTR in the finals. Seems like the most likely outcome. FTR's on the other side of the bracket. I don't see how they lose. Bucks FTR to me is a classic match that should happen again. Tag team titles. What better two tag teams in AEW than the Young Bucks and FTR? They are head and shoulders above the rest of the tag team division. I don't know what other tag teams you could even say are in their league. Like, who, who, who? What's number three? Like, if if the Young Bucks well, and FTR are the two best tag teams in in uh, AEW, who's number three? I mean, you you have to put in Moxley and Claudio because they beat FTR, right? But are they a tag team? For the but they're not part. even in the tournament. No, because there's some sort of scheduling conflict or something. And then other people will tell you it's because Moxley didn't want to lose or something or they didn't want them to lose or something like that. Maybe it's that too. Who knows? But they're not in the tournament. But they'll face the winners of the tournament eventually. You'll see that, I'm sure. Double or nothing, they'll probably face Moxley and Claudio. Uh, probably the Bucks. Maybe. I mean, that would make sense. But right now, the tag team division, if you look at it, they're in this tournament pretty much. I mean, you know, I think maybe the acclaimed, they're missing. Yep. But as far as tag teams, I don't know what tag teams in AEW are really missing from this thing. You have Young Bucks, Private Party, Undisputed Kingdom there, Taven and Bennett, the best friends, which are usually Chuck and Trent, but for this thing it's orange and trent they put their a team out there let chunk sit on the sidelines they call him chunk ftr against infantry in the opening round i guess that'll be on collision i don't know when that's i guess collision maybe tomorrow they'll start that makes sense why yeah. not and then uh, ricky starks and big bill against top flight probably on collision too and then i think ricky starks and big bill will wrestle ftr in the next round and then ftr will win and they'll take on the Young Bucks in the finals at Dynasty. When the Young Bucks uh, on Dynamite coming up Wednesday, they'll beat the best friends, and then it'll be Bucks versus FTR in the finals. Tony Khan will probably fuck things up and make it like the best friends versus the infantry in the finals, and it'll be a match no one wants to see, and we'll have to tag team champions that no one cares about. But hopefully they do the right thing and have the Young Bucks win the tag team titles at AEW Dynasty. I think that's the move. I think that's the move. FTR versus the Bucks, and then uh, Bucks steal their way to the championship, kick uh, FTR in the balls, and uh, become champions. Yeah, I could see that happen. Makes sense. Yeah. I like it. So uh, AEW Tag Team Title Tournament in full effect. Johnny North, uh, I know you're having internet problems. Tonight, having all sorts of issues. I think he just froze out on me. I know he we'll, wanted to talk about the dark side of the ring. We'll talk about it. You want to talk about dark side of the ring? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so last week, it was Terry Gordy, and this week, it was Brutus Beefcake. Uh, so what do you think? Terry Gordy? It's a pretty rough story. Terry Gordy, you know, they t talked about his story. He was a very young guy to start in pro wrestling started as a teenager and grew up in wrestling was kind of a prodigy joined the Freebirds, was a big star could do everything went to japan and uh you know he partied and did a lot of drugs one day he od'd on an airplane and he went into a coma and it gave him severe brain damage when he came out and he was never ever the same he wrestled, but he was just not quite the guy he used to be, and there was clearly something wrong with him, and he had memory problems, and it was just very sad and just another lesson to people not to do drugs, not to take pills like Terry Gordy was doing because he was doing uh, some bad stuff that messed him up in a very severe way. And it was just sad to see a guy full of life uh, on the first half of the story, and then at the end, he's just kind of got, there's just nothing there. And to hear his friends talk about him and Cornette's crying about him, it was sad. 
You never want to see Jim Cornette crying. It's always sad when Cornette's crying. You know something's real sad. Johnny North is uh, gl- glitching out on us tonight. I think our show is fine. I think our like I don't think it's uh, the Ringside Report uh, Studios. I think it's Johnny North having internet issues himself. I don't think it's us, John. It's you tonight. It's not me. It's my internet's been hicking up the whole night. Hmm. In fact, up during SmackDown, just problems. Hmm. I was just saying, Terry Gordy. Uh, sad, uh, sad story. Reminder not to do drugs, and it's always sad when you see Jim Cornette cry, right? It's sad to see like a lot of people cry on these shows because I don't know if you have noticed, like last couple of weeks, Dark Side has been a lot of tears, just a lot of sadness. Mm-hmm. Mind, and Terry Gordy one, it, it's really up there. It's probably the saddest episode I think of the season so far. Yeah, and. Versus children too, especially to see that I, I didn't realize it. Maybe you knew that Jesse from uh, Bestus, like that he was um, his son. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, like, why did they never make that on television? It's it's weird. I think they said something about it on commentary, maybe a couple of times, but it was just you know they gave him a gimmick. Well, even WWF, like, they hit him as the executioner, right? I mean, I understand why they did that at the time, but... For Terry Gordy, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of it, they're just hiding about it. Maybe maybe a lot of it, when people look back on it, and they're just trying to not let people know about it so much. It could have been because of that. The way Terry Gordy kind of stared off into the distance, it now makes me think his son, uh, Jesse who was with, paired up with Festus, who kind of stared off into the distance. Do you think, because Vince was a sick man, right? We know this. Do you think it's possible that there was some sort of rib? Oh, I hope not, but maybe. It's not possible. I wouldn't I mean, put past them. Right? Like, it's not out of the realm of possibility that the nope. Jesse putting Jesse with Festus, who was this guy who was, I mean... Now that you think about it, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was a rib. Because, like, he's a guy who's completely just, like, comatose out there until the bell rings, Festus, right? And then the bell rings, and he's a monster, and he can wrestle and everything. Then the bell rings again, and he's just back to staring off into space, which is basically what Terry Gordy was for a while after the overdose. He would wrestle, you know? But then after the matches, he'd just be staring off into space. And then they put his son in there, Jesse, with Festus, Jesse and Festus. And Festus is basically doing like a Terry Gordy gimmick. It was a rib. I'm convinced of it now. Think about it. They'll never uh, accept that. They'll never like say that's true. Jesse had to know. Well, maybe. Holy shit. I'm telling you. Vince is fucking evil. They did that on purpose. Why? It's such a weird gimmick. Why would they do that? Well, WWE will deny that. I mean, Michael Hayes denies the whole story that the uh, Dark Side said about him, like that he got it, like Terry Gordy's job, which is kind of like weird. Where it's like Michael Hayes is there. And he he doesn't know that Terry Gordy's there. That, that seemed kind of weird. But if he denies that, they're going to deny your theory as well, though. Of course. But looking at the facts, John, it does seem like it was some sort of rib on Terry Gordy when his son and just everything, just and just a horrific practical joke it's not funny but i'm sure vince had a good laugh holy shit the the fastest gimmick was a terry gordy fucking rib oh oh i like to think it's not but uh dude I, I, how I could you think it's of... not how could you think come on look at the f- come on you don't think it is I didn't know all I, I, that stuff about Terry Gordy. 
before the dark side of the ring. I didn't know that he like like I know about his wrestling career and everything, but I didn't know that he had an overdose and was kind of messed up afterwards. But knowing that and knowing the Jesse and Festus gimmick, like uh... I just remember people talking about him and then I think one of the matches I saw of him was against Bam Bam Bigelow in ECW and he just wasn't what people would talk about about him. Like he just seemed kind of slow and just to do basic moves was kind of tough. Mm-hmm. Then watching this, it's like, well, it all makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Brutus Beefcake story is basically uh I was friends with Hulk Hogan. He taught me how to wrestle. He gave me jobs everywhere I went. He took care of me forever. And now I'm way, way retired from wrestling. And he isn't my friend anymore. We don't talk anymore. He doesn't like me because he doesn't like my current wife. Right? Yeah. And that was the the beefcake story. Also, he had his face ripped off in a terrible para paragliding accident where a woman was flying up and her knees smashed his face and he could have died but he didn't he had a crazy surgery and survived it was a lot of recovery it was very difficult but he did survive and that was a crazy story but I've heard that story about Brutus before I didn't love the Brutus dark side of the ring because to me it was like yeah it was the paragliding accident and I know about it and it was horrific but he did survive and it was you know fine um, and it was crazy that he survived and it's, it's a crazy story, but once you hear it once or twice, you're like, all right, I get it. I didn't need to see it on dark side of the ring. I've heard him say it on podcasts and interviews like a few times. It's like, all right, I get it. Um, and then the Hogan stuff is like, yeah, okay. They didn't really go anywhere with it. It's like, well, why is Hogan mad at your wife? Uh, they say, I don't know why Hogan's mad at me. Well, people are saying it's cause your wife did something. No answer. Nothing. It's like, okay, they didn't really get anything from there. They didn't even they didn't even say like requests for comment from Hulk Hogan went unanswered. Like, at least give me that at the end. Don't give me like nothing. Cause to me, if you're telling the story of Hogan and Brutus and you're just getting Brutus aside, and Brutus aside is like, Oh, I don't know, he doesn't talk to me anymore. I love him. And Hogan's wife, is, and Brutus's wife is like, I don't know. And you go, okay, well, what's actually, what happened, really? What happened? And then there's nothing from Hogan. They don't talk to Hogan. At least tell me at the end, like, oh, we tried to talk to Hogan, but he didn't want to talk to us. I mean, that's what I understand, but I would have appreciated that, too. I just wanted more answers, because really I got nothing out of the Brutus dark side of the ring. I learned a lot about the Terry Gordy thing. I learned nothing out of Brutus's thing. I knew that they weren't on speaking terms anymore. I knew about all that. Yes, there is a dark side about Dino Bravo. You can check it out. Portier. Just saw that question pop up on the screen. Um, but, yeah, I didn't love this one. My favorite one of the season so far has been Buff Bagwell. It's going to be hard to beat Buff the Stuff. That one was amazing. I learned a lot, and it was shocking. That is the one to watch this season so far, right? Yeah, yeah. Buff's the definitely the standard so far for uh, best episode, but I, I I didn't mind this one. Like, again, the whole him getting his face smashed in, and I I wouldn't have mind like seeing like photos if they would have had some photos of that. Like that would have been interesting to see, like his face having get reconstructed pretty much. Like I'm, I'm, it was cool to talk. To, they talked to the doctor that fixed his face. I thought that was kind of interesting how that whole procedure went down and just how WWF, like WWF t- took care of him pretty well. Like I don't think WWF gets enough credit for how like they helped them and they kept them employed during that whole situation. Mm-hmm. Cause of Hogan. Yeah. Well still, but they helped them out and like gave them like a good promo and everything. Like that whole segment, like that whole, like, um, his like barbershop promo thing like that wasn't just like oh give him a spot like things happened on that like Mm -hmm. historic moments in wrestling history happened there yeah and like no matter what you think of brutus i know and that was kind of neat too where not everyone said positive glowing things about him 
you know, great to have him Valentine was very honest. Like, you know, he didn't mind them, but sometimes he just wanted him to shut up. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't mind that there was a lot of honesty. Like some people like him, some people didn't. And them talking about the anthrax as well. And then Greg Valentine being honest about it. Again, I appreciate that stuff. See it whose side like I'm on, brother. You see the man in the background, brother. What man in the background are you talking about? I can't write okay, that. like, I don't know, what, we're taking sides and stuff? Like, Always on sides. Hogan's side, brother. I don't know what Brutus' wife did, but I, I'm on Hogan's side. I don't know what happened there. I don't know why Hogan's not talking to him anymore. But Hogan carried this man for his entire life. And I am on Hogan's side. I don't know what happened, but just seeing both of them and how they operate and Brutus saying, oh, I've, it was just powder for my headache. It wasn't cocaine. I don't know. And then Greg Valentine's like, come on, dude. It was cocaine. <laughs> come on, man. Whatever's going on there, I'm on Hogan's side, brother. And is it because I'm a Hogan super fan for life? I'm a Hulkamaniac forever, maybe, but, you know, Brother Brudai, he messed up, brother, and that's what happens. Terry will turn his back. I'm not feeling it, brother. Oh, Brutus. not a bad episode, right? It was okay, I, I but, like, I don't know. I don't love Brutus. <laughs> don't, don't turn your back on Terry. He did something. Something happened. I don't know what it was, but I don't know. And it wasn't that interesting. It wasn't that dark. It wasn't that dark for a dark side of the ring. That Buff Bagwell story, that was dark. That was nuts. The calf implants, shooting his own father, just banana stuff. That was a crazy episode. Becoming a male gigolo. Like, I mean, that was one of the best episodes of Dark Side of the Ring ever. Just the stories that came out of it. You're like, yo, this guy is a movie. You know? Some of these other guys, it's like Brutus is like, what happened to you? What's your life? Uh, I was in a paragliding accident, and uh, Hulk Hogan was my best friend, but uh, now we're old guys. He doesn't like me anymore. Ah, uh, cool story. Buff Bagwell, what's your what's your life? Uh, I was in WCW. I was in the NWO. Yeah, okay, big deal. Who wasn't? Oh, I shot my father. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why'd you do that? Well, he was attacking my mother, and then uh, he pulled a gun on me. So, uh, well, at first I pulled a gun on him when he was attacking my mom, and then, then he pulled a gun on me, and we were kind of in a standoff. So so I shot him, you know, and then and I calf implants, nearly died because I wanted to look jacked, but my calves weren't jacked enough, so I got implants. And uh, they nearly killed me, but I got them taken out. I didn't want to. And then... Uh, you know, I became a male gigolo, and then I left one of my wives, my third wife, I think, at the time, uh, for one of my clients, and that didn't last, of course. And, uh, you know, of course, drugs and alcohol were a big part. I had some real drug problems, but, yeah, whatever. It's, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol, for some of these guys, is the main story in their dark side of the ring. Buff Bagwell is just like, yeah, you know, that too, whatever. So much shit, this guy. So much shit. Brutus is, like, paragliding. Hogan. Buff is like you could do like a whole HBO series on this guy. You know? Give me a mini series about Buff Bagwell and his life and times. Some like even Terry Gordy, it's like young wrestler, great wrestler, good story, did drugs, bad OD, sad, kept wrestling. I mean, it is kind of a fucked up story, but Buff Bagwell. Buff fucking Bagwell. Buff the stuff. That guy had a story. I don't know who's got, like, as far as Dark Side of the Ring goes, Buff is one of the all-time all time greats. Who has the craziest story? Well, come on. Buff is one of the all-time greats on Dark Side of the Ring. Buff, who, who has the best... All like dark side of the ring story. I'm not talking about like, yo, it's set, like Owen Hart, which is just a bummer and he's not on the show, whatever. But like 
characters that you're like, holy shit, you did what on Dark Side of the Ring? Because Buff is up there to me in the character Dark Side of the Ring Hall of Fame with New Jack, because that was a good one, and with, um, what's his face? Fucking Pizza Cutter. Nick Gage. Oh, Nick Gage. Yeah, which was a hell of a Dark Side of the Ring too, right? But to me, the top three all-time Dark Side of the Ring guys, the best Dark Side of the Ring guys are New Jack, Buff the Stuff, and Nick Gage. And this season, we got a guy that could go up alongside in the Hall of Fame with Nick Gage and New Jack telling their story on Dark Side of the Ring, and their story is just hit after hit of bananas things that they did in their lives. New Jack, of course, rest in peace since the Dark Side of the Ring. Nick Gage and Buff still rocking. But I think Buff is up there with New Jack and Nick Gage. Am I missing somebody, John, of, like, the crazy characters from the Dark Side? I mean, Ric Flair doesn't count because he wasn't interviewed, you know, playing Ride from Hell and everything, but that doesn't count. I'm talking about, like, guys that it was about one guy, Dark Side of the Ring, and they were maybe there to tell their story. Who was more wild? He wasn't really there, but Doink. They did one about Doink, right? About Matt Bourne. He didn't do that much. I thought it was pretty crazy in the end, the way he he died in the end. Like, that was kind of nuts. He didn't shoot anybody. (laughs) <laughs> I thought it was up there. I mean, Nick Gage robbed a bank. New Jack almost killed a guy in the ring. I mean, come on, man. Give me something. Those three guys are the best Dark Side of the Rings ever. Nobody better than those three characters. The fact that those three guys have existed in pro wrestling is one of the reasons why pro wrestling is pro wrestling. Characters like that can only thrive and flourish in professional wrestling. In no other business would Buff Bagwell, Nick Gage, and New Jack become as successful as they were in pro- in professional wrestling. They're not making the money. They're not getting the fame. They're not getting any of the stuff in any other avenue outside of pro wrestling. Buff Bagwell may be in the gigolo world, but not, you know. I was going to say that. I don't think you can get famous being a gigolo, though. I don't think that's a thing, you know? Uh, outside they of Deuce Bigelow, though. I can't name many male gigolos. And that was just a movie. Rob Schneider doesn't do that for real, that I know of. Well, what's next week, though? I think they said next week, didn't they? Johnny North, male gigolo? What are we talking about? Next week on Dark Side of the Ring? Uh, or next week on Wrestling Uncensored? Hopefully dark side. Hopefully this doesn't become a dark side. Oh, my God. Plan anyway. Dark side of the ring wrestling uncensored. That would be bad. Um, the life and legends of Harley Race. Who? What is that? What's that going to be about? Should be interesting. I love Harley Race. I love Harley Race stories. Hopefully there are some Harley Race stories I've never heard because I – seek out Harley race stories and I've heard many of them and I love them all. A lot of them involved handguns and knives. <laughs> I hope we hear a lot of gun and knife stories from Harley race. I mean, obviously he's not alive anymore, but uh, the people talking about Harley hopefully have some good Harley stories. So that'll be fun. Harley race. And then we have Chris Colt. Welcome to my nightmare. I don't know who that is. Who's Chris Colt. Not sure. I guess we'll find out. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, we'll find out about him, some sort of uh, controversial character. The gentleman, Chris Adams, after that, that'll be fun. And then they're going to do Sensational Sherry. She had a bit of a guest spot in the Brutus one. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, she died young. Uh, And then they're doing the Sandman after that. And they are closing out the series with Black Saturday. Do you know what Black Saturday is? Black Sat was that the um wasn't the WCW pay per view, was it? So it was July nineteen eighty four. I'm looking this up. Uh okay. Vince McMahon. And the WWF took over the time slot on TBS that was Georgia Championship Wrestling. 
and WCW that was there for 12 years and Vince bought the time slot and took over and which led to uh, Ted Turner who owned WTBS at the time buying the successor to Georgia Championship Wrestling which was Jim Crockett Promotions and then creating WCW. Ah, I see. George, so, so Georgia Championship Wrestling had a weekly TV show on WTBS that was called World Championship Wrestling. Okay. Okay. And then Vince on Black Saturday in 1984 took over that time slot and started broadcasting WWF there instead. And then Ted Turner, that led to him buying the Jim Crockett Promotions, which was Georgia Championship Wrestling, and then changing the name to World Championship Wrestling WCW. This is going to be a whole episode. Well, I guess it'll be about Vince, how he took over, and a lot of the takeover of early WWF days and territories and WTBS and Georgia Championship Wrestling and Jim Crockett Promotions. I'm not sure what they're going to do. It's called Black Saturday. That's the topic. That's the final episode of the season. Who knows what they'll do? I don't know. Wait, wait and see. I mean, the Jerry McDevitt episode was interesting. Like, I wasn't expecting what we got off that. So, see what they have for that one. Um, yeah. The steroid trial episode you're talking about, right? Last season? Right. Was that last season? I mean, season? as long as you have... Uh, maybe the seasons prior, possibly. Yeah, it was maybe it was last season. Mm-hmm, I think it was, no, it was the season before. Okay, but as long as you have someone good to talk for, like it's fine. The episodes can be really good, even if the topic's not great. Yeah, it depends what they cover and who they cover it with. Uh, so we'll see. I'm looking forward to the Harley Race episode, though. I love Harley Race. Coming up next week on Dark Side of the Ring. Johnny North, just to give you an update on the Boston Red Sox, your favorite baseball team, we have a final in Seattle, and it ended one nothing for the Mariners. So uh, Red Sox now 1-1 one and one on the season. Not bad. That's not bad. Not as good as 2-0 and oh like the Yankees are, who sit in first place in the AL East right now. The Rays beat the Blue Jays today 8-2. to two. At the Trop. And I don't see that the Orioles even played. So I think that the Yankees maybe are alone currently. Yes. Celebrating. So place. the Yankees are alone at the top of the AL East right now. 2-0. and I love it. Orioles, 1-0. and Half a game back. The race is on. <laughs> They haven't played the second game. That's right. <laughs> uh, it's great. Every other team is one and one though. Jays, Red Sox, Blue Jays, one and one. Yankees are two and zero. Oh. It's well, that, a good that's start. That's good for me. I don't mind that. No, it's all even so far. It's very early, too early to celebrate. But seeing the Yankees beat the Astros tonight uh, puts a smile on my face for sure. Very nice to see Johnny North. When is your next wrestling match? When can people see you in the ring? So April 20th in Sudbury, got a casket match against Magnum McLaren, projectxtix.com. So projectxtix.com. Get tickets. I think they're almost sold out too. Wow. Projectxtix.com for more. Projectxtix.com. Go check out Johnny North if you are in the area. It is definitely worth the trip to go see the big man. Check him out at North Genesis at Genesis Johnny North on Instagram at North Genesis on Twitter or X. Have we changed to X? Or are we still? I can't not call it Twitter. Am I? You know, I don't know. Well, some people say formerly known. Some people say also known as. Yeah. So weird. I mean, however you want to say it. Can't Elon just change it back to Twitter so we can stop being weird? Come on, Elon. Be cool, man. Like, it's weird. Because no one is really sure what to call it. You well, know? now people just you... say social media now. 
Yeah, but that is a large umbrella. I feel like if you have a product, you don't want to have confusion as to what it's called. And if Twitter is a product that you own, wouldn't you want to have a clear message of, like, this is what it's called? I know they're trying to push this X thing, but everybody still calls it Twitter. If I own Twitter, I would just be like, it's Twitter. Come on, guys. Stop messing around. Because X is just, no one's adapted it. No one's become saying, like, yeah, it's X. Some of them are, like, you know, formally whatever, but it's just still, like, uh... You know what I mean? No, There's no confusion with Instagram or Facebook. We all know what they're called. TikTok. We know what they're all called. It's stupid. I'll talk to your buddy Elon and ask him, you know, like, can you switch it back? You know, text him. Right now, like you're doing. I'm not texting Elon. I'm just checking. <laughs> My brother texted me about the Yankees after. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have uh, Elon's number, man. I don't know Elon. If I had Elon's number, I would ask him for one of those trucks or a car or something. I wouldn't ask him to change a name at Twitter. If I could text him and ask him to change the name at Twitter, I think I could probably get a free base model Tesla, which I would take. It's not like I want one, but I would take one. You know what I mean? Why free car you? is a free car. Yeah. yeah. I'd take a base model any car for free at this point. Why not? Free car. Not a bad thing. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, Okay, that's it. Uh, That is all. We are headed to WrestleMania week. Get ready. It's going to be some big, exciting times on the Ringside Report Network. Next week, it is WrestleMania. Next Friday night on Wrestling Uncensored, we'll preview WrestleMania. And then after night one on Saturday, we'll do the post show for night one and get you ready for night two. And then on Monday, uh, just before the Raw, after a WrestleMania, about 7 Eastern here on the Ringside Report Network, we'll do the post show for WrestleMania night two. So big, big week next weekend for Wrestling Uncensored and the Ringside Report Network. And then the following weekend, we got UFC 300. So a lot of big things happening here in the world of pro wrestling and mixed martial arts. Next time we will be live here will be Thursday night. Um, Thursday night for Ringside Report MMA and a PFL one in San Antonio will be happening on Thursday night as well. So there'll be some live MMA action going down as we're on, or maybe just as we're wrapping up the show coming up Thursday night with Freddie and AJ. I see AJ in the chat, my man, AJ hope he's doing well. He should be back with me on Thursday. Freddie should be with me. We'll have a lot of fun coming up Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, every Thursday for Ringside Report MMA right here on the Ringside Report Network where we have Wrestling Uncensored every Friday hey, night, Dave, 10 p.m. Eastern party. time. 10 p.m. Eastern time, Wrestling Uncensored every Friday night. Uh, we'll be back here next Friday, 10 p.m. after SmackDown to preview WrestleMania. A-I-H-A, you want to talk now? I think when you mention his name, like that's when he just randomly says something. There might be something in that someone may have put in the programming where if you say A-J's name... Hey, Dave, here's my parlay. On the prelims, I pick every underdog to win. All right. Thanks, A-I-H-A. He's picking every prelim underdog tomorrow for the UFC show. He's definitely picking Manon Fiorot, who is the underdog. I'm picking Aaron Blanchfield, and so is Fred. Tomorrow for the big UFC show, I've got, uh, what was my parlay? It was Blanchfield and uh, Luque. Blanchfield and Luque. Fred's parlay was uh, Blanchfield and Buckley. And AJ going with Fioro and probably all the underdogs on the main card. And that is your info that you need for the weekend here on the Ringside Report Network. Thanks for sticking with us to the end. We would really appreciate it if you could help us spread the word. You know the drill. Hit that subscribe button. Flip those notification switches. We are an audience-supported network, so consider becoming a recurring supporter at membership.ringsidereport.net. Check out our website at ringsidereport.net. Hope to see you again next time, and have a good night.